Hi, I'm Rohan. I'm the co-founder of FACE. And in this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of our project. Uh, we'll uh, walk through the code a little bit. We'll uh, go through the development setup for contributing to FACE. Um, and we'll have a look at some of the issues on GitHub as well. So a bit of background on the project first. So we are an open source uh, secrets management platform. Uh, we're very much focused on solving the problem of managing application secrets, uh, particularly in development uh, kind of environments, but also in CI and production setups. So there are other tools that you may have heard of, such as uh, HashiCorp Vault or AWS Secrets Manager that solve the kind of secrets management problem mainly for production setups. So you would see those tools generally used only by SREs, and then developers are left kind of just dealing with .env files or uh, just hard coding secrets and you know just using bad practices because there's no there, there aren't really very many good tools focused on developers and that's really our focus so uh, we have a CLI as part of the platform uh, that lets you basically inject secrets so if you're running you know yarn dev or Django run server or something locally in your dev setup you can just inject secrets uh, without having to like <laughs> worry about .env files and all these things um, we also made it work without any uh, code changes to your project. You don't have to install any packages or dependencies. It works with pretty much any language, any framework, uh, any stack that you use. Um, the other part of things other than development is really around uh, deployment of secrets. So um, having a single source of truth is, uh, we believe, super important for managing secrets. If you've had, if you've worked in a bigger team in the past and you, you may have experienced this, you know, you have maybe GitHub Actions um, for CI pipelines and you have a bunch of secrets there. You have GCP for your production and you have a bunch of secrets there. Maybe you have Netlify for preview builds and then you have some secrets there and you just have this scattered uh, kind of situation of what, what's called secret sprawl, uh, which can be a big problem, not only for security because you need to keep track of you know what, what secrets are where, who has access to what, it's super hard to manage. Uh, and then if you need to update something, like if you need to update your API token or a database password or something like where do you go who has access to what where do you update it this becomes a huge problem so having a single centralized uh, kind of place from which you can deploy all secrets and control it in one in one go is a big part of the platform uh, so we have auto auto automatic syncing you can set up so if you have a bunch of secrets in your staging environment you can connect it to your uh, you know Vercel or your cloudflare pages builds and then just make sure that it automatically stays in sync um, and similarly i mean we've made it uh, we've spent a lot of time making it work with all kinds of infrastructure uh, providers. So whether you're running on AWS, TCP, Azure, uh, whether you are Dockerizing, whether you're running, you know, on Railway, like you know, a pass, uh, whatever it is, uh, our our uh, phase will work. And being a security-focused tool, we've also focused a lot on the kind of um, audit uh, auditability and access control and these kind of features, which are pretty important. So a uh, big missing part of secrets management currently uh, without a dedicated secrets management tool for a lot of teams is just making sure like only the right people have access to secrets and you know if you have .env files it's pretty much impossible to uh, to log anything who has access to what to control to revoke access if some employee leaves the company how do you make sure that they don't take a env file with them and walk away uh, things like this um, and then we have some more also enterprise specific features like uh, IP allow listing. So if you have a complex uh, infrastructure setup, you may want to uh, restrict access to certain IP addresses, things like that. So yeah, you can have a look at our, our website. It talks a bit more about the features. Uh, and if you want to know a bit more on the basics of secrets management and why it matters, we have a, a blog in our blog section. You can check that out. Um, Let's uh, let's let's uh, get the project set up locally. So let's uh, go through that dev setup. So uh, this is our repo phase console. Uh, you can just clone this to your machine uh, locally. Um, and I would suggest checking out the contributing uh, doc. So this goes over just basics that you need to run it. Uh, and we also have instructions on setting this up locally. So if you come down here, uh, we have instructions on that. So let's just go through this uh, step by step. And I'll show you how that works. It's quite straightforward. Won't take more than a few minutes. So uh, first step is we have a uh, env dev example file. So this is just an example env file that you can use as a baseline and then just add the secrets that you need and add the values you need. So we're just going to copy env dev example into .env.dev. And that gives us our new env.dev file. Let's open that to the side maybe. 
Uh, step two is to add an auth provider. So uh, we uh, phase lets you log in either with Google, GitHub, or GitLab SSO. So you can pick whichever one you like. Uh, for this demo, let's go with GitHub. So I'm going to go to my GitHub uh, on the top right, open the menu and go to settings. And once that loads, apologies, I guess GitHub is a bit slow today, this morning. You just give it a minute. Okay, great. Uh, settings, go down to developer settings, click on that, uh, and then create a new GitHub app. Uh, you just quickly log in. Yeah, create a GitHub app here. You can call it whatever you like. I'll call it phase demo two because I made a phase demo app earlier. Um, Homepage URL doesn't matter. You can put localhost for this if you like. Uh, the callback URL should be uh, localhost API auth callback GitHub. If you want to know detailed instructions on this, you can go to our docs and under self hosting environment variables, we have detailed instructions on each of them. So if you're using Google or GitHub, uh, or GitLab, you will see instructions on, you know, what to set as the callback URL and all this. Uh, coming back here, so I've set my callback URL. Um, that is all we need to set. We don't need webhook. Um, and that's it. Create a GitHub app. Okay, and we're going to get a client ID. So copy that client ID and come back to our ENV. And we're going to add it in GitHub client ID, paste it there. Go back here and then we're going to generate a client secret. Just click on generate client secret. It's going to give you this value. Just copy that. Come back to your env file and paste github client secret. That's that. Um, all the other thing we need to do is this uh, variable called next public next auth providers. Uh, just you'll see that this is, has Google, GitHub and GitLab. Uh, this basically just controls which sign in buttons you see on the login page. So just for ease of uh, convenience, since we know we are only using GitHub, I'm just going to make it GitHub and get rid of the other two. That's it. Uh, next, we're going to build. I think on my machine, I need to use sudo, but you don't may not need to use sudo. Simply enter that command and that's going to build your development setup. Okay, uh, that's built. Uh, that may take two or three minutes depending on, on your system. If you have a slow machine, it may be a bit longer, like five or 10 minutes, but luckily you only have to do this build once. Uh, once it's done, we can just copy this command, which is gonna bring up our containers. Uh, I need to run sudo. Please don't run sudo. It's just a bad thing I'm doing. And that should bring up our project. Uh, if we look at the dev docker compose, uh, while this is coming up, we can just see the basic kind of setup here. So we have an Nginx just for uh, managing uh, the web server. Uh, we have a front end container, which is uh, Next.js app. We have a back end, which is our Django. We have a Postgres database. Um, we have a Redis uh, and RQ worker. I will, I will go through these later, why we need that. Uh, but that's, yeah, main thing is front end and back end. Okay, looks like it's up. So once you see it's up and it's ready, uh, you can simply go to your browser and open HTTPS localhost. Uh, 
And yes, that's not a mistake. You can use HTTPS because we have a self-signed certificate uh, added in our Nginx. So you can accept, depending if it, this is on Firefox, I just said accept the risk. You can do that safely. If it's uh, Chrome or Brave or some other browser, I think it has a slightly different uh, UI, but uh, it will, you'll get this warning for self-signed certificate, just accept it. And let's wait for it to load. It should be loading. Yeah, again, depending on your system specs, um, it might be slower or faster, the dev server. But yeah, you should see this. You should see login page with GitHub. So we'll just say login with GitHub. And you should see the app that we made here, which I call phase demo 2, should be here uh, to authorize. Click authorize. And that will lock you in. Not sure why did we come back. Uh, yeah, there we are. So yeah, not sure why that login happened twice. I think usually it's just something to do with latency. Sometimes the, the request times out if your dev server is a little bit slow. So anyway, you should be able to log in and you should see this onboarding page. Um, so first thing we need to do is just set up an organization. So I'm gonna call it uh, demo. Yeah, I'll just call it demo, uh, create a password. Password should be about 16 characters. Um, yeah, just use something easy. Uh, you can leave this ticked. Uh, this is just going to store the uh, password locally on your browser so that you can not have to log in every time. Uh, account recovery, I suggest just keeping this. It's not a big deal because this is your local dev setup. You can always delete it and create it again, but just keep that. If you're setting up phase for like actual production use, make sure you keep this very carefully because uh, if you forget your password, you're pretty much locked out. Everything is end-to-end -end encrypted and you will not be able to uh, get access to your account without that recovery kit. So that's it. That's our onboarding is done. Uh, and we should get dropped in the, in the home page of the dashboard. My fonts are broken here. This may be just something with my network today or my PC when I was building but hopefully you will not have that problem. I think it's just a Google font falls, falls back to that. So yeah, we are in our uh, homepage of our organization that we call demo. Uh, so Secrets in phase are basically managed uh, in like two layers. So we have apps and environments. So if we go to apps here on the left, uh, apps are basically meant to represent something like a like a project essentially. So a front end or a back end or an API, something like this, a singular app application uh, with a set of secrets that you need to manage. So first thing we'll do is we'll create an app. I'll just call it API. Uh, you can choose to populate an example set of secrets. I would recommend doing this if you're just setting up your dev setup because it will immediately give you some secrets in, to populate the UI so that you have something to work with. So we'll just click create. And that's going to create an application here called API. And if we open that, we'll see that it's pre-populated with uh, three environments. So we have environment development, staging, and production. Uh, and each of these is basically a set of secrets uh, for as, as, a, as the name implies, for development use, uh, for your dev workflow, for staging is something like CI pipelines or builds, and production is for production deployments. So if we click on, let's say, development here, uh, you will see that it's pre-populated with a set of kind of example secrets. Uh, here we are. So uh, you can explore the UI features here. This is basically the UI of keys and values for secrets in this environment. Uh, if you want to create a new secret, simply click on new secret. 
you can type the name of the secret and hit deploy to save it. Uh, you can reveal all secrets. You can reveal specific secrets. Uh, you can modify secrets just by typing uh, and hit deploy. Uh, you can click history to see the kind of uh, change history of a given secret. Uh, you can do overrides, comments, there's tags. I'll, I'll leave that to you to explore all of that. Uh, but that's basically all you need to get your basic dev uh, setup working. Uh, you can use the uh, logs from the Docker Compose to see if anything goes wrong. If you have any errors, uh, always check the browser console, check the network logs, you know, basic things. Uh, okay, that's our basic dev setup complete. Uh, next, let's go into a quick, uh, just kind of high level walkthrough of the code. So uh, let's start with the backend. And I think a good place to start will be the models. So if you go to uh, API, models.py, uh, knowing the basic structure of the app as I just described uh, in terms of we have organization, within organization we have apps, within apps we have environments and environments have secrets. That's really the basic of it. Um, and if you go through the models, you'll see that it's fairly straightforward. So we have an organization model, which is what we created when we onboarded. Um, we have a app model, so you'll have, you can have multiple apps per organization. There's a foreign key for organization there. Uh, within app, uh, we have we, we also have users, of course, in our organization. So each user that we add is an organization member. So you'll see the model for that. Uh, we have our environment model here, which is uh, for uh, managing secrets. As I said, you can have development, staging, production. Uh, and then we have a uh, bunch of related models. You'll see a secret model as well. So here's our secret model. This stores individual secrets. Uh, so yeah, it's all fairly straightforward. If you are uh, familiar with Django and Django models, it should be all quite straightforward here, nothing complicated. Um, for the API, for the front end, uh, we use a uh, GraphQL uh, API. So we use Graphene Django. If you have used GraphQL in the past, you probably, with Django particularly, or with Python, uh, you would have heard of Graphene or Graphene Django. So uh, there is a, it's a large schema dot by file um, and I'll apologize to all the developers in advance for the size of this file. It's it's huge. Uh, if you're interested in helping us refactor this, that would be great. We need to do a bit of code splitting. But uh, basically, we have two main classes in this file is a query class and a mutation class. Uh, these just handle all the query resolvers for the different GraphQL uh, kind of queries available. And then the, the mutation class handles all the uh, mutation resolvers. I think the mutation class is a bit better organized because we are importing a lot of stuff from outside and we have done code splitting. But uh, yeah, these are where all the resolvers are. And if you want to see how any of specific one of them are implemented, just click on them. You can go to definition. So for example, for creating an organization, uh, these are the arguments that are passed to the to the mutation. Uh, and this is the kind of logic that runs. So yeah, feel, go, go through schema.py as the kind of starting point to see how any particular uh, uh, APIs that are, are implemented uh, in the in the GraphQL layer, uh, and that should give you a good idea of how things are handled. Um, you know, creating apps, deleting apps, creating secrets. Uh, you'll find all of that here. Uh, okay, that is schema pi. Um, what should we look at next? Um, yeah, what, one thing I should mention is so we have uh, we have Graphene Django. Uh, we have a types.py file. Uh, this declares all the kind of type definitions for uh, everything over the GraphQL kind of API layer. So you'll have defined types for everything, organization type, uh, member type, uh, you'll have an app type. So these are all uh, just basic types and some of them have custom resolvers for specific things. So for example, for the environment type to get what is the number of folders or number of secrets in an environment, we have some custom fields and resolvers for things like that. Uh, but again, mostly fairly straightforward. These just use all the Django models as the base model for things um, and then adds any required logic uh, on top of that if required. Uh, these types are also used to generate a schema GraphQL and all the TypeScript types for our front end. So uh, we will look at that in a second. Uh, if you go to uh, within backend, there is a readme.md. Uh, if you just open this, you will see this script here. 
So this essentially uses our uh, GraphQL schema in schema.py. So that includes all the query resolvers, all the mutation resolvers, and our type definitions. It will use that to generate uh, uh, schema.graphql in our front end folder, as well as GraphQL uh, types with another script that I'll show you in a second. So let me open a new terminal, the side here. Uh, I'm going to go into my backend folder, uh, create a, v a virtual environment, I would suggest if you've not uh, got one already. Uh, I already created one. You can install requirements with, you know, pip install dash r requirements txt. You'll find it here. I've already done that. Um, and next, all we need to do is run the script. So uh, you will need some secrets uh, in your uh, settings pie. So in my case, I'm I'm just using phase to, to do this, but you can do it how you prefer. Uh, but running the script is going to basically use our schema definitions in uh, the Django app to generate a GraphQL schema on the front end. So if you go to schema.graphql, uh, this file in our front end will be automatically generated. Uh, so in case you are making any changes to the API, if you're adding new queries, new mutations, changing the types, doing anything that requires a schema change for the API, simply run this script and it will auto-generate schema GraphQL for you. Uh, then all you need to do is back out from this, go to your front-end folder, and then run yarn code gen. Uh, if you know code gen, uh, you, you know what this does. It's going to basically then use schema GraphQL to create all the TypeScript type definitions. Uh, uh, this is going to create, so these five, graphql.ts, so we'll have uh, TypeScript types for all our uh, models, so like uh, organization, app, uh, all of that will be defined here, and then you can use that in the code. Uh, yeah, uh, generate this code gen file also if you are creating any front-end queries, so I'll get into that in a second when we start coding the front-end code base, but uh, making the point of uh, inheriting types in our front-end from our backend. Um, for the backend, there's not a whole lot else. Um, like I've said already, the code uh, organization is not the greatest, but you should find everything you need from the base files. So uh, for views, there is not much since we're using a single GraphQL view. Uh, that's over here. Uh, that just handles all routes to the GraphQL. Uh, for auths, uh, this is around CLI. I don't think uh, yeah, this is authentication middleware. Uh, what else do we have in our views? We have uh, this secrets.py. Uh, this you'll have you'll see two class based views here: uh, E2E secrets view as well as a public secrets view. These are uh, REST API handlers for the CLI and the SDKs. So. E2E secrets view is just end-to-end -end encrypted secrets view. So it's just CRUD API for secrets that the CLI uses. And the public secrets view is for the public API. So if you're self-hosting or you're using cloud, uh, phase cloud, uh, there's a REST API that you can use, uh, which uh, handles all the encryption, decryption, server side. So this is the a REST API handler for that. Um, plus we have here, uh, Lockbox. Lockbox is just a tool we have similar to um, uh, if you know, like, like it's kind of like a paste bit, or if you know Doppler, it's a bit like Doppler share. It allows you to share secrets uh, with like a single, like secure link. Uh, so this is just a simple uh, REST API handler for that. Uh, that's about that. Everything else, uh, you can go to settings by and look at it. There's a few custom things, but mostly it's a very straightforward settings. Uh, config, if you've used any Django app in the past, should be fairly straightforward. Uh, yeah, you'll find everything you need here. Okay, I think that covers the basics of the back end. Let's go and look at the front end. So the front end is a is a Next.js app. Uh, we're using app folder. This is Next.js 14. Um, and you'll find everything under uh, these dynamic slugs. So if we go back to our application for a second, you'll see that uh, we have in our in the URL structure we have the name of our uh, organization in the root. So if I just click on home, you see that uh, it's the, the name of our organization. If I go to apps, it's demo slash apps, and then if I go to a specific app, we have the app ID. So you'll find the URL structure here inside app folder. 
team is basically the name of your organization. It's a dynamic uh, parameter route. And within team, you have members, you have recovery, you have settings, tokens, apps that just basically uh, matches all of these things that you see here. So uh, organization slash integrations, if you want to manage integrations, just go in here and you'll find uh, the code there. Uh, within team, there is, uh, like I mentioned, there's apps and an app parameter. If you look at that, that's our app UUID. If I go to a specific environment, it's at slash environments and then environment ID. So if I open environments, you'll see this dynamic path here. Uh, the dot dot path is really just because we can uh, manage secrets in folders. So if I create a new folder here, I just call it new folder. Uh, that lets us create secrets within folders. I can create a secret here. Uh, and you see that that path is also handled in the in the URL. Um, for components on the front end, uh, there is a components folder with a set of common components in common. So these are kind of usable. So basic things like button, uh, alert banner, uh, just a display card, input field, uh, some standard components. Uh, there's a few more components, uh, or, or rather there is more potential here to increase uh, this set of common components. If you go to the UI and you see reuse of things, um, I would encourage creating uh, common reusable components. That just helps to keep things very standardized across the UI. But yeah, for basic things, you should find what you need here. Um, and apart from that, components are mostly organized uh, for the uh, uh, depending on the context. So uh, components specific to the whole secrets uh, and folders UI, you'll find in environments, secrets, secret row, uh, you know, history, pop up, all of these things, you'll find them mostly organized. Uh, so depending on what uh, feature you're working on, what issue you're working on, you should find everything you need. Um, what else do we need to cover? Yes, code gen. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, in the front end, folder Apollo. Apollo is, by the way, the GraphQL client we use. So we have Graphene on the back end for the GraphQL server. And for the GraphQL client, we use Apollo. Uh, Apollo uh, is going to use the schema GraphQL uh, uh, for the types that I said that's generated by that script I showed you. And then for generating the actual TypeScript types, we use CodeGen. So we go to our, uh, when we go to our front end folder and say yarn CodeGen, it uses, uh, there is a config here, I believe, uh, codegen.ts, yes. This is the configuration that codegen uses. So it reads the schema from schema GraphQL and then generates uh, the, the uh, TypeScript types that we need in here. So again, if you're making any changes, um, even to the front end. So on the front end, all the queries and mutations uh, are here client side inside GraphQL folder, Graph, GraphQL queries, you'll find all the queries here. So get dashboard, get organization, all the GraphQL queries here and mutations also here. Again, mostly organized by, by type. So organization related mutations like deleting an organization member or updating uh, a member's role, all of these kinds of mutations. For secrets, you'll find them in environments, uh, delete a folder, create a secret, et cetera, et cetera, yada, yada. If you are creating any new queries mutations in this folder, or you're changing, making any modifications, just make sure to run yarn code gen again, because it'll also generate, uh, it'll also use these queries and mutations to create uh, this gql.ts file that just validates basically all your queries mutations and will give you, it'll also give you helpful warnings. If something is wrong, for example, you've not passed the right arguments to a specific mutation, or you're querying some fields which are not queryable or you need to make some change to that, it'll it'll give you uh, good helpful warnings when you run code gen. Uh, other than that, uh, it is a standard Next.js TypeScript app, uh, like I said, app folder. Uh, nothing too complicated. There's nothing, there's a pages folder here, but this is just for Next auth. Uh, if you've used Next auth in the past, uh, this is just for handling authentication with Google GitHub and GitLab. Uh, Nothing that you should need to really touch here. Um, yeah, that is that pretty much covers that. Yeah, I should also mention uh, I've touched on the end-to-end -end encryption just very briefly in the in the start of this video. So, uh, Phase is an end-to-end -end encrypted platform, 
And what that means is that the bulk of the cryptography and all the encryption decryption happens client side. Um, and you'll find all that encryption code inside the utils folder. So if you go to utils slash crypto, uh, there's an index.ts that just exports, but you'll find specific crypto utils for different kinds of things in these folders. So let's say for users, so generating uh, seeds. Uh, so this, this, for example, this util simply uh, uses a, uh, a given seed and an organization ID and generates the kind of encryption keys for a, for a single user. Uh, you'll find most of these are fairly well documented and, and uh, they have test cases as well that you can look at to understand. But if you are curious about how all the encryption works uh, in phase, then I would recommend going through uh, all of these uh, all of these utils and it will give you some understanding. If you have a background on basic understanding of things like public key encryption, signatures, key exchange, all of these things, then most of this should make sense to you. Um, and we're also working currently on a new security page in our docs that will kind of explain the high level architecture as well as some of the low level implementation of our of our security and our crypto here. But uh, uh, yeah, this is where all the, all the utils you'll find. Um, one more thing that we have not actually looked at yet is the, I mentioned in the start about this uh, Redis and our queue worker. So as I mentioned, phase lets you sync secrets to third parties. So you can set up integrations basically with Cloudflare or whatever. If you go in the, in your uh, app and you go to integrations, you'll see there's a bunch of logos here for uh, credentials. So Cloudflare, AWS, GitHub, all these things. So these basically let you, you can store your credentials here and once you've stored some credentials, you can go to your app where you have some secrets and set up syncing. So I can automatically sync, for example, my secrets in my development environment to, uh, let's say, Cloudflare. So if I, I need to enable SSE, this is SSE is server-side encryption. So because we are uh, kind of syncing secrets to a third party, we need to make sure that they can be decrypted on the server. So just enable that and that will enable the syncing UI. So you can create a sync by setting up, like I said, credentials and then picking an environment, so I'll say like, you know, okay, take my secrets from development, sync them to Cloudflare, take my secrets from production, sync them to whatever, AWS, right? Um, for that syncing to work, if I show you on a one, I have some syncing set up here, I believe, uh, in my production, yeah, here. So for example, if I make some change to a secret uh, and then deploy it, you'll see uh, that this spins and this uh, basically triggers a sync job on every time uh, I change some secrets in an environment. Uh, if I go to syncing tab here, you can see the, the status of the sync, you can see history of syncs, uh, all of that. And all of this is handled by uh, this worker. So this RQ worker, you can look at RQ of, uh, RQ is a basically um, a, a Redis uh, queue manager for Python. Um, and we're using that to basically create uh, a worker that handles these sync jobs. So if you go to tasks.py, uh, here is where basically we have a trigger handler. So every, like when I change some secrets in an environment, I call this uh, function. This function is going to simply check like what service uh, have I set up the sync with. So is this Cloudflare pages, AWS Secrets Manager, Hash Record Vault, whatever it is. Um, and then call a perform function uh, to basically perform the sync for each of these. And you'll find all those perform functions are here. Uh, these basically handle syncing to third party. Uh, you can explore this code base uh, if you want to know the details of how we do the, the syncing. But basically we have a Redis layer. So every time we trigger one of these jobs, uh, it gets put into a Redis queue uh, and then the worker handles picking jobs from the queue, processing them, uh, performing a sync, and then updating the, the kind of status of the job. So that's what this job handler is. This is for our queue. So that's what the Redis is for uh, and the worker. Okay, uh, that covers most of the basics of the code base at a high level. Of course, if you have any more questions in detail, you can always uh, ask on GitHub. You can jump on our Slack and uh, we are always around to answer more questions. We can even hop on a, a huddle or a call with you and explain things in detail. So feel free to ask and connect with us. 
Um, to finish up the video, let's just quickly go through the issues. Uh, we have a few issues here if you're working on, on Forsac or, or otherwise. Uh, you can take a look at a couple. Um, let's have a look at this one, tree list uh, navigation. So as we've seen in the UI, we have this apps uh, uh, item in the sidebar, but you may have many apps and inside each app, you may have many environments and navigating, like if I'm from home and I want to get to uh, the production environment, I have to click on this, click on the app, click on production. So we want to kind of ease the navigation and allow uh, all your available apps and environments to be kind of listed in a tree. And that's what this issue is describing. So basically creating a tree list structure like this, which lists uh, kind of makes expandable UI that shows all the uh, all the kind of environments that you have access to. Uh, and you can see that we have just given a kind of rough, kind of not even a wireframe. This is just a concept really for the UI and how it can work. Uh, and then we can uh, we can then explore UI ideas which the community is doing already. We can see. Uh, let's take a look at another one that may not be worked on yet. Um, some are simple bug issues. So, for example, this one, I think, yeah, as I as I showed you earlier, we have like this change history of a specific secret. But in this case, I think when a path of a secret, so the folder, basically, if I move a secret from one folder to another folder. It's not shown in the UI. So this is just a simple bug report, uh, which can be worked on. Um, let's look at some more interesting issues. Uh, yeah, if you look at this one, tags. So in the, uh, in the UI, uh, we have, uh, or rather in a platform, we have the concept of tags. So you can create tags. So if I say test, give it a color. Uh, I've created a new tag called test and you can tag secrets with uh, specific tags. So this secret, I've added two tags here. I can add a tag for this uh, and I can click deploy. Um, these tags uh, are available organization wide. So now that I've created, for example, this test tag, it's available uh, for any apps in this SpaceX organization. Problem is, they, we currently don't have any UI for either editing or uh, even deleting these tags. So if I just make a typing mistake or I just change uh, my kind of conventions around how I want to tag secrets, there's no real way to handle this. So this UI is basically for creating a tag management uh, screen somewhere in the, in the, in the product where, where we can manage that. So renaming tags, changing the color, and deleting tags is the three things that we should be able to do. Uh, don't have a, uh, a high fidelity UI for this issue, but we have um, uh, an inspiration from the GitHub UI, which I think will work mostly for our purpose here. Uh, so this is an entire screen that could be built. Uh, yeah, let's look at some other, one more issue before I close the video. Um, let's see. Yes, we can look at this one. So um, if we look at the UI once more, as you may have seen a couple of times, if I make some change to this secret, this first secret, I type something, you see this banner up here that says, you have undeployed changes to the environment. The secret color changes to yellow. Um, this is fine for a single change like this. It's clear enough what change I've made, which secret I've changed, and I can always click discard and you know discard my changes. But this becomes very difficult to manage when I make multiple changes. So let's say I change the name, change the value of a couple of secrets. Um, I change the, the key for some other secret. Uh, maybe I change a tag over here, um, and maybe I add a comment on some other secret, right? Now it becomes very complicated to really know what exact changes have I made and which ones are, is everything fine basically before I click deploy. Uh, this doesn't tell me any de detail really. And these yellow colors only tell me that, okay, this particular secret was changed, but I don't know what was changed. So the idea of this issue is really to give more context to a user before they click deploy on exactly what is the details of changes. So the idea is to be able to click a button or expand this in like a pop-up and show me itemized details. So, okay, for AWS access key ID, you change the value. AWS secret access key, change the value. Maintenance mode two was renamed from maintenance mode. 
and I added a tag here and on this secret you added a comment and the comment says whatever XYZ. Uh, that's kind of the idea of this of this UI. How it will look um, is uh, I, I've given one suggestion which is using basically uh, like VS Code type UI. So over here the UM uh, refers to untracked files, modified files, but we may need a slightly different UI because different properties may change for different secrets. Uh, so this would be like a very useful enhancement to the to the product. Uh, give a lot more context, particularly when you have integrations. So if I'm going to click deploy and these secrets are going to sync to some critical service in production like AWS or something, I want to be absolutely sure what I'm deploying and what changes I've made. So that's super important. So yeah, feel free to browse all the issues. As you can see, many of them have already been assigned. I'll be adding many more issues uh, as we go. So, and if you have yourself, I would suggest also exploring the product, looking for uh, improve, potential improvements, things that can be uh, fixed or new feature ideas. Feel free to create your own issues, tag them um, and start working on them. Yeah, okay, that's it. Thank you, thank you so much.